Good evening from the UK. This is an urgent appeal on behalf of the ALGRF, or the Amiga Little Gaitis Recovery Foundation. Every week, more and more cases of Little Gaitis are emerging. Little Gaitis is a condition of the mind that is contracted after binge watching episodes of the excellent YouTube channel, the 10 minute Amiga Retrocrest, or 10 Mark, as it's also known. And yet for some reason, the episodes seem to last 43 minutes. They, 43, 43 minutes? I digress. After infection, you will start to refer to things around your home as little guys. Your computer, your mobile phone, the toaster, the dog, everything becomes a little guy. This can be extremely distressing to you and your partner. And in some cases has led to us hearing stories of early divorce and even insanity insanity. Luckily, it has not affected me in any way. But do not worry, all is not lost. With the right counselling, and by continuing to watch the excellent 43 minute episodes of the 10 minute Amiga Retrocast, you too can make a swift recovery. And before long, you will be restored to your rightful place as an upstanding member of the retro community. We thank you for your time. And please, stay safe. Uh, uh, are we done? Are we done? Great, great. I'll, I'll just turn off this little guy. What? What, what do you mean we're still rolling? What? goodness thank you pete that's all i can say is thank you hi this is doug from dynamic computing and welcome to episode 65 of 10 minute amiga retrocast now a few weeks back i introduced you to my a570 cd rom drive this little beauty right here she's open right now and one of the things i mentioned was that back in the day, it had the ability to add an additional two megabytes of RAM and a SCSI controller to it, but they had long since been discontinued and they were hard to find. Well, I went out on eBay that same day and found the RAM for like $35 from a guy. And I found the SCSI controller, I think it's a newer model, from the same guy, ordered those little guys, and a few weeks later they came in. Now, this makes the Amiga 500 with the A570 just about as powerful as an Amiga 2000 with an A2091 controller card in it. Let's take a closer look at these little guys. Now, this is my naked A570 CD-ROM drive with the cover taken off. You'll see right down here, it has an expansion bay that's designed for the two megabyte memory card. And over here, you'll see that it has an expansion bay for the SCSI controller with a little faceplate area that pops out the back. Both of them pop into place nicely. This is the memory card here. Uh, very simple, has a jumper on it for turning it on and off. Now, when you install it, make sure you install it with the memory facing outward like this. Do it the wrong way, it'll fit in just fine and probably fry your memory. I'll go ahead and put this in. And you'll see it slots in there nice and tight. Kind of cute. Now the SCSI controller is a two-part deal. Here's the physical connector here, and it has pins where this little guy attaches right to the top. So we're gonna plug this in first. It only goes in one way. There's no way to put that in upside down. But this one, it would be easy to put it in backwards. Make sure you put it in with the chips facing outward right under this connector. And do yourself a favor and always on things like this, 
make sure that you have the pins lined up properly before ever applying power. It's so easy to have one or two pins off on one side or the other, or just on the front half or just on the, half, the back half if you're doing it in a hurry. Just take care and you won't burn out your components. Now it also came with this cool little cover right here that fits nicely on here. And then we've got a little screw to hold it in place and a couple of these little nuggets that go right in here. Now the cool thing about this is we also have a switch in the back here that turns the SCSI on and off. So you have, if you have games or something that are just totally not being nice when you have a SCSI controller connected, just flip that little switch, it turns the SCSI off. You can remove this jumper over here, it turns the RAM off, but that's harder to get access to when you have the lid on here. Now notice, all you have is an external 25 pin SCSI connector here. There's no internal SCSI connections at all. And that's okay, as you'll see in just a moment. Enter the SCSI to SD version 5.5 from our friends at Inertial Computing. Now this little guy was designed to be used on a Mac with an external SCSI connector. But internally, it's pretty much the same as the version 5.1 card. It comes in this slick little case, and on the back, you've got your micro SD card, and you've got your USB connector. Now, in theory, you could use up to a 128 gig card, I believe, but don't even bother. Just go with like a 4 gig or an 8 gig card. You don't need that much for this kind of situation. You can get power using the USB connector right here and just a standard like phone type uh, USB connector. But the cool thing is the A570 sends plenty of power out its 25 pin port, gives this thing power on its own. So once we plug it in here, like so, and we plug it into the Amiga 500, she's ready to be powered up. It doesn't need any external power. Pretty cool. Now you set this device up exactly like you do the SCSI to SD card that I went over last year in my review video. I'll put a link to it in the description, but in a nutshell, you launch the SCSI to SD utility in Windows, you plug in a USB cable here, and you tell the utility what size drive you want to use. Now, in theory, this could handle a four gig drive. Amiga OS 1.3 could handle four gigs okay, but with fast file system not being optimized for big drives, I decided to stick with something smaller. I created a 500 gigabyte partition on this, this eight gig card and I divvied it, up, divvied it up from there. I could easily add up to three other virtual hard drives on here, but at this point in time, I don't need the space. Now I've booted to Workbench 1.3 here from Floppy. I'll explain why in a few minutes. Um, the nice thing about this hardware is it's completely auto config and completely auto booting. Auto booting means that it's going to detect that there's a hard drive connected when we get it set up and it's going to try to boot to that automatically. That's something that Amiga OS 1.3 introduced that 1.2 did not have. Auto config means that when you plug a new device in, like the memory or the SCSI controller, the Amiga looks at it and says, hey, that's memory, I'm gonna put it in the right place. Oh, that's a SCSI controller. I'm gonna yank the virtual device driver right off the ROM chip, set up its addressing, and I'm off and running. We don't have to go into a config sys and an auto exec bat like we used to have to do in a PC of the same generation and map out which memory address it uses and pray that we have a free IRQ and DMA channel to use. It just works as long as it's well-designed hardware. We had plug and play before plug and play was cool. Now you'll notice that I did stick Amiga OS 1.3 in here and this is completely intentional. The CDTV was designed with Amiga OS 1.3 and the 1.3 ROMs in mind. And if you start to throw in the 2.x or the 3.x ROMs, some of the CDTV features no longer function. It'll still work as a regular CD drive, but some of the enhanced features won't function. 
The other reason is I don't have any other Amiga OS 1.3 systems. All of mine are 3.1.4 systems. And so I wanted to be able to experiment with the, the old way that I grew up on from 1988 to 1991. I wanted to be able to play with this again and create some new tutorials for you in the next coming weeks. Let's take a look at the auto config features. If we go ahead and go in here to Workbench 1.3 Shell. And we type Avail for Available Memory. You're gonna see that it comes up with uh, one megabyte of chip RAM and about two megabytes of fast RAM on here, which is absolutely fantastic. Now, on an Amiga OS 3.1.4 machine, two megs of fast RAM and a mega chip is not gonna be enough. But on a 1.3 machine that's really designed to work from floppy, it's, it's more than enough to do a lot of stuff. It's really quite good. Amiga OS 1.3 did not come with the utility to format and partition the hard drives. It was assumed that the hard drive controller manufacturers would supply their own software. So some enterprising people came up with a nice standardized hard drive installer that works just fine under Amiga OS 1.3 and 2.x. Let me call it up here. I put it on my extras disk. Now, you can get this over. If you have a second Amiga, you can just copy it to a floppy on the second Amiga. Um, if you have If you don't have a second Amiga, you got a CD-ROM here. Burn the thing on a CD-ROM and bring the file over that way. Works just fine. Now, the first thing I want to show you is if you have a different kind of controller, we want to click on it with the left button and go to Info. And then from here, you can change what kind of controller you're looking at. In our case, it's SCSI.device, so we're good to go there. But if you happen to be using it with a different device, you can change that right there. Here, language equals English. By default, when you download this off of AmyNet, uh, which is where I got it from, it is going to default to German. Just change this to English. It'll come up in English if that's your language of choice. Now we're going to launch the software and it should detect the new drive that we set up a little while ago in Windows. Uh, remember, you can set up multiple virtual drives on your SD card up to four, and each one can be up to four gigs in size. Don't try bothering to go, or don't bother trying to go bigger in OS 1.3. It can be done, but it's really not worth it. So it sees our device here. If I had multiple virtual drives, set up, it would show one, two, three, four, up to four virtual drives here. Now, the first thing we're gonna wanna do is set up the rigid disk block in um, on the operating system on the um, hard drive. So what we do is we go to file system. Now, rigid disk block is something cool. It's a bit of a, a genius on Commodore's part. What it is, it's a special piece of code that resides on a special place on Amiga hard drives. So if you hook up the Amiga hard drive to another Amiga, the rigid disk block is read and it knows the size and format of the drive automatically and which device driver it was created with. Uh, it's absolutely genius. And this is part of the reason you can plug your CF card or SD card right into WinUAE and everything's just recognized because it reads the rigid disk block. Now here, what we have so here what we want to do is add a file system to it. And what we want to use is the FAST file system, or FFS. We're going to click that, click load. The original file system, or OFS, was prior to Amiga OS 1.3, and that was really designed for floppies. The FAST file system works well on smaller hard drives. Now remember, Back in the day, in 87 and 88, when this kind of technology came out, a 20 megabyte hard drive was standard, a 100 megabyte hard drive was huge, and a gigabyte hard drive would have cost as much as a small car. 
Fast file system does okay with smaller hard drives. It's improved over the years and is now pretty good. But with Amiga OS 1.3, we have to make sure we use the right version of the fast file system. Notice hard drive installer defaults to DOS 3. This is a 2.x version of the filing system. It's called the International Filing System. Now, while there are ways to get it to work with Amiga OS 1.3, don't bother. Change it to DOS 1. That is the file system that was included with Amiga OS 1.3. It will prevent all kinds of problems just by choosing the proper file system here. Just click use and it'll save. Okay, mine's already saved. Now, the next thing we're gonna do is partition the drives. Now, I've already done this, like I've mentioned. Mine is partitioned into a 48 megabyte boot partition called DH0 and a 462 megabyte work partition. Now, I easily could have gone with a gigabyte or two gigs or four gigs, but I wanted to make sure that everything was gonna work and be compatible, so I went with nice small ones. And considering OS 1.3 is mainly a floppy-based system, you can pack a lot of floppy based software into 462 megabytes. Now you just use uh, edit partition here if you want to change the size and you can use this slider right here to change the size of the partitions. You want to choose fast file system here, not DOS, not fast file system international. You want to choose fast file system. That is the proper one to use, FFS DOS 1. Now, you wanna make sure auto mount is selected. You wanna make sure bootable is selected. And you can set your boot priority here. This means that the CD-ROM and the floppy drive have a higher priority for booting than this. If it doesn't detect a bootable CD or it does not detect a bootable floppy, it will boot to the hard drive. Buffers, you can set up your buffers here, how many buffers you wanna to use to, to speed the drive access up a little bit. Block size with 1.3, with the kind of hard drives you're gonna use, 512 block size is usually just fine. These, mask and max transfer, you will change these if you use an IDE hard drive. You have to change them, or IDE hard drives. For SCSI, because SCSI is a lot more advanced than IDE, you don't need to bother. The defaults are just fine. For your second partition, if you choose to use one, you do not make that bootable. It does not need to be bootable. So you see this is uh, blanked out. And you can change the size here. You could make multiple partitions if you want to. Just give them the name DH1, DH2, DH3. Once our drives are partitioned, the next thing we want to do is go to DOS format. Okay, now we can choose DOS DH0, we can choose DH1. Again, tell it fast file system. Do not tell it the international file system. You are going to have problems with that. Change the volume name, like call it workbench for DH0. You can you call it work for DH1 or anything else you want. And then just do a quick format. Quick format is fine. You don't need to do a full format, although it doesn't take too long. Once you format the disks, it will ask you to reboot the system. So we would go ahead and reboot the system. Now we'd have our workbench DH0 and our work DH1, but the thing still wouldn't boot because there's no workbench on it. They're just blank disks. Now, with Amiga OS 1.3, there is no installer for it. You don't have an installer button on the disk to install the hard drive. So how do you get Workbench to work off of it? It is so easy, it's unbelievable. What you do is you just launch a shell and you type in copy df0 to dh0 colon clone all. And literally all that does is copy your entire bootable Amiga OS 1.3 floppy right onto the DH0 partition. Copies everything over, 
makes it a bootable hard drive, just like that. You do the same thing with the extras disc. Uh, just when you're done copying over the uh, workbench floppy, pop it out, pop in the extras disc, use the same command. Copies everything right over to your new partition and you're in like Flynn. This thing works just perfectly. Now, let's see. We'll pretend we did that since I've already done it. And let's see how she boots. We're gonna start from a restart here. No floppy in the drive. And we're gonna let her rip. Come on, Amiga, boot up for me. It's already booting. And now she is going to be done. And there it is, all booted up. Takes about 20 seconds. And now we have our workbench partition. We'd copied our floppies over and we'd copied our extra folders over. And you can see, even with all that copied over and a bunch of extra stuff I've put on, you still have a ton of space on the 50 megabyte hard drive. That's why you don't need to go crazy with hard drive size in Workbench 1.3. Now that we've got Workbench copied over, we can start copying over files to our work folder, our programs. A lot of 1.2 and 1.3 programs did not have hard drive installer routines right on the floppy disk because it assumes you didn't have them. But a good percentage of them, probably 60, 70, 80% of the programs, not games, the programs, would run okay off a of floppy drive. You just do the same thing. Go in to Amiga OS and create a folder. Let me show you what I mean here. So we'll open up our work drive. Let's say you wanted to install Deluxe Paint on here, all right? Now this is kind of funny how this works. Unlike the newer operating systems from Amiga, you can't right click and go up here and choose new folder. What you do, you go to your workbench, you find an empty folder, you drag it and drop the empty folder over, click it, rename it, we'll call this Deluxe Paint. Okay, now we have a folder called Deluxe Paint on work. Now you'd put your Deluxe Paint floppy disk in the drive, say into DF1, and you'd open up a shell again. And man, all you have to do, same thing. Copy DF1 to work colon Deluxe Paint clone all and it copies the contents of the floppy right over to your work partition in the Deluxe Paint folder on the hard drive. Not elegant, but absolutely functional. So we've got that figured out. How fast is this? It's faster than a floppy. Now, the SCSI to SD version 5.1, that's the one I did the review on a couple of months back, that's rated at about three megabytes per second, and that's pretty accurate. I get two and a half to three megabytes per second easy. The version six of that, the one I have in my Amiga 4000, is rated at six to 10 megabytes per second. I get about 6.3 to 6.8 reliably. This little guy, the 5.5, is rated for only Five, or only one megabyte per second. It is slower, it must be something to do with the fact that it's external, I'm not sure. But it's only rated at one megabyte per second. Realistically, in the drive tests I've done, I get between 350 and 650 kilobytes on average, sometimes up to 800 when I'm copying something. It's not blazingly fast, but it's 10 times faster than a floppy drive, and it's huge, so it really makes up for it. Let's just try a couple little programs, see what kind of performance we get in the real world. I'll go back to the computer. We're going to go ahead and go into my graphics folder. Here's dpaint3. We see it comes up nicely there, and icons are in the way. We're going to launch dpaint3. That came up mighty quick, faster than floppy. 640 by 480 over scan and 16 colors, why not? The program comes up lickety split. 
a lot faster than coming up on a floppy without a doubt. Let's load a little picture in here. Now one thing you're going to notice and something I'll talk about when I do my uh, tutorial is the for Amiga OS 1.3 and lower machines you're going to find that they do not have standardized requesters like in our newer ones. And you see it loads up pictures just fine. It loads them up pretty speedily. Let's try something else. How about a word processor? We'll go over to programs here and ProWrite. Give that a little launch, see how quickly it runs. See, perfectly acceptable. One megabyte per second uh, data transfer just fine and it's all set to go so we've determined that the hard drive works just great in here you've determined that the RAM works just great in here we can load workbench on here easily we can load programs on here relatively easily they launch fairly quickly nothing that's gonna you know break any records but absolutely usable and absolutely faster than going with a floppy how about going back to our cds now the other week when i did my review of the a570 i mentioned that the euro demo disc that i had was full of of compressed demos and compressed mod files and I would decompress some of them to a floppy drive when this was a floppy based system, play them off the floppy and it worked fine. But now that we got a hard drive, we can use the same disc and just decompress all kinds of stuff and see what kind of fun we can have with it. So let's take our Euro demo disc and see what we can do with it. Now we're gonna go ahead and go back to a shell because I like to work in the shell. And you're going to have better luck working with the LHA program right now from the shell. We're going to change directory to CD0. We're going to go to the audio directory and see what's in here. Modules. And see what's in here. Let's look through Q through Z. CD Q through Z. And let's find a mod to transfer over. We'll just pick one at random here, see if it's any good. Symphony.LHA. Okay, so now we're going to decompress it. Now I've already moved the LHA file over to the workbench installation on the, on the hard drive. So this, it'll launch it automatically. And we're gonna do Symphony dot LHA and we're going to tell it to decompress it to work music slash mods a folder I already have created we're going to let it do its decompression now just for laughs I did some decompressing on my 68060 on a 900 kilobyte file uh, and it, it on my Amiga 500 that's that module took about um, Mm, 30 40 seconds to decompress on the 060 it took like one second to decompress and it's pretty impressive now let's take a listen to the mod we just created now i happen to have a nice mod player in here i'm going to go to work music deli tracker which is actually a pretty good mod player and we're going to take a look at the one we just downloaded load it up and we're going to go to dh1 music mods symphony and away she goes playing a mod not too shabby huh 
So now I have a way I can decompress any of these mods I want to, any of these demos I want to, and have all kinds of fun with them. Now I'll be honest here. I've downloaded a few more CDTV titles, and I've played with a few more CDTV titles. And I'm sorry, they really suck. They really do. Um, I'm not looking at this with my 2020 mindset and looking at 1991 software with my 2020 mindset and deciding it's bad. I'm thinking of it like I was sitting there in 1991 playing with this and thinking, eh, this isn't fun. You guys know I love my Amiga software. Heck, I, get, I got photon paint up here the other day from 1988. I had an absolute blast with it. Does wonderful. So much Amiga software does such a wonderful job. But CDTV stuff just, they just didn't get it. They didn't, they didn't understand to take advantage of it. But I do enjoy being able to take things like this Euro demo disc with all of its files on it. Public domain collections are absolutely awesome. There's whole CDs full of mod files that you can get. That kind of stuff, it works fantastic. If I want to get a program that I, you know, a bunch of programs I've downloaded off of AmyNet and I want to put them on my computer here, great. Download them in Windows, burn them to a CD. I got 650 megabytes of room on that CD. I can throw stuff from AmyNet. It also does a great job right in here of playing audio CDs. Uh, there's a tool that comes with the CD player, with the, the A570. I put mine under the utilities drawer. And it literally just comes up with a cool little interface that allows you to play audio CDs and they play just fine. And you can play audio CDs while you're doing stuff on the Amiga. The Amiga doesn't care. It's multitasking. So what's my opinion of the A570 with its two megabytes of RAM expansion and its new SCSI interface and the SCSI to SD? Was it worth the, the money that I invested in it? <laughs> oh, heck yes. It's taken this Amiga 500 from something that sits on my shelf or sits on my bench to something I actually want to use and play with and have fun with. Now, if Commodore had played their cards right back in the early 90s and had a device like this, an A570 with two megabytes of RAM and SCSI built right into it, it could have changed things. I mean, suddenly your Amiga 500 that was feeling a little long in the tooth what? Now I can run anything I want on it? I could upgrade it? I could put OS2 on it? I could uh, put a hard drive in there? Well, could have changed things quite nicely. So I'd say I give this a thumbs up even today. If this also works with a, an internal accelerator, for example, the Terrible Fire, something like that, that's going to be so sweet. I just hope that something like that does not disable the, the CD in there. I'm just going to have to try one and see. I guess I need to order one now. I would like to thank my wonderful patrons who make this weekly show possible. And to do that, here's a lovely picture of me from 1988 sitting in front of my Amiga with a beautiful mullet and a nice earworm mod from the Amiga 500 for you to listen to and enjoy.
If you would like to help me out and help support this channel, please visit me at patreon.com forward slash 10 mark. Please like and subscribe this video. Leave a comment below if you, have, you found it interesting, you want to add something to it, you've got recommendations. Tell me about your awesome rigged out A500 system. I want to hear all about it. Let me know in the comments below. Follow me on Twitter at 10mark1. But until next time, this is Doug from 10 Minute Amiga Retrocast signing out so I can regrow my sweet, sweet mullet. <laughs>